So I took a little bit of advice from the previous speaker and I changed transformation for evolution. Because I guess transformation does kind of imply you start something and then you finish it. Yeah, you're transformed, but that's not really how it, how it works. So uh, I decided to change that. Uh, my name's Martin Hinchewood. Uh, I kind of live in two places. Uh, one is Scotland, uh, which you can maybe hear in my accent. I'm not sure. Uh, and the other one is Mexico. Uh, so I have, uh, uh, my wife is from Mexico and I uh, spend a lot of time there. But I'm obviously very worried about the news at the moment because I have, my countrymen are, <laughs> seem, seem to be not that smart at the moment. But at least I can feel secure in the knowledge that the smart people are in yellow. I have, I have high hopes, the smart people are in yellow. Um, feel free to contact me, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, I'm pretty much everywhere, as any uh, good speaker is. Uh, and my tack is a little bit different, because my background, although I'm a professional Scrum trainer with Scrum.org, so I do have a background in Agile, uh, my long-term background is in DevOps, and for me, DevOps is just the other side of the Agile coin. Lots of people say DevOps when they mean Agile, and lots of people say Agile when they mean DevOps. Um, so f f for me, the, the two terms are synonymous. Yeah, you can't have one without the other. If you're, if you're building software in your organization, you can't be Agile and not have good engineering practices. That's just not going to work out. Um, so this is a, a, an exp a definition of DevOps that comes from Donovan Brown at Microsoft, which is DevOps is the union of people, processes, and products to enable the continuous delivery of value to your customers or your end users, depending on. It's, there's some good data out there on um, innovation and the difference between people organizations that are good at DevOps and organizations that are not good at DevOps. And one of the main differences that I like is the, the amount of time organizations spend on new work versus struggling with complexity. Uh, if you automate a lot of things, you have good DevOps, you can spend up to 50% of your time. That's 20% more than the organizations that are not doing so well at DevOps. And while 20% doesn't sound like a lot for the effort you might put into delivering good DevOps practices, um, if your budget is a billion dollars, then 20% is a lot of money, regardless of uh, your size or how you cut it. Um, so there's some, so just some good uh, uh, data there. The world has changed. Everybody here, I think, is uh, pretty familiar with it. But also, um, Microsoft has changed. I don't work for Microsoft. I've been an MVP, um, most valuable professional, if you don't know what that is, uh, with Microsoft for just over 10 years. Um, I've been working with the Azure DevOps team at Microsoft for, well, since 2006, however many years that is. Um, and it's gone through a number of names since then. So. If, if you don't know Azure DevOps, you might have known it as VSTS, or before that, Visual Studio Online, or before that, TFS Services, or before that, TFS, or before that, Visual Studio Team Services. They have an identity crisis with this product, but don't worry about it. It's all the same thing, it's all the same idea, uh, trying to get software delivered more quickly. Uh, so I, I, I have a, a, a little question. Can you think of an application that was an epic failure of quality? Windows Millennium? Well, that was the end of the 9x line. I'm pretty sure that was, that was just a fail of everything. Um, but I was thinking more of Windows Vista. Windows Vista had awesome ideals about what would be in the product. And all of the videos and information that came out before they started developing it were like, oh, this is going to be awesome. And then all of that stuff was quietly swept under the rug 
because they realized it was impossible to deliver. And they actually spent six years delivering a product that they intended to deliver in two years. That's a lot of overrun. And it had, well, when it eventually came out, it was not bad, but yeah, they had problems. What about uh, another product? Something that's a complete mismatch in customer desires. Windows 8. Windows 7 was just Windows Vista fixed. Windows 8 was a big mismatch. 50 per you either loved it or you hated it. And it was more, more or less 50-50 in the community, which meant it didn't meet the customer's needs. So I want to tell a little story about how this organization has moved in the last eight years from being a waterfall organization, like a lot of other organizations in the world, to being an agile organization, where they were delivering software continuously to production. Um, I always like to use Windows as an example now for customers, because customers always used to say, our software is too big and too complicated to do agile with. And I always say, but, but Windows continuously delivers to production to over 500 million machines worldwide. Is your software bigger or more complicated than that? I don't think so. Has anybody got a big Git repo? Like a really big product in Git? Anybody? Anybody know how big the Windows Git repo is? Because it is in Git. 350 gig. One Git repo, mono repo. So Azure DevOps was the group within Microsoft that really started their Agile transformation that became the catalyst for the rest of the organization. Uh, before that, everything was delivered as a box product, like printed on CDs and actually delivered to customers. Um, but in 2010, the Azure DevOps team realized that they can't shorten the feedback loop any shorter than two years with box product. That was their main problem. That's why you get a new version of Visual Studio every couple of years and the service pack halfway through. So they started this journey uh, towards, um, towards that value of being much more quick, quicker. Uh, Sprint 1 was in 2010. Uh, you see Sprint 151 in April 2019. And they actually have, a, there's about 4,500 people in the developer division at Microsoft, 700 people-ish working on Azure DevOps. So that's uh, 151 sprints with that many people working on it. It wasn't Satya's brainchild to make that transition, but when he became the CEO of Microsoft, we finally had an engineer in charge of Microsoft again. And he saw what the Azure DevOps team had done and they decided to push it through to the rest of the organization. And he talked about something called 1ES. Anybody here heard of 1ES? Okay, stands for One Engineering System. It means that if you're a developer working on um, Azure DevOps, and you go move to the Windows team, you shouldn't have to figure out how to go build that software. You should, you should understand the tools that are involved already, regardless of the platform. So that thing could be built in uh, Node, it could be built in .NET, it could be built in Java, but the tools that wrap it, that enable us to do our job more quickly, need to be the same across the organization. That's what they believed. And Azure DevOps is that tool for them, and they now have just over 100,000 users in Azure DevOps. Um, less than half of them are actually engineers. Most of them are uh, product management and uh, business management. I've got a question. Who here builds software? OK. How many times do you deploy your software? Let's say per month. How many times do you deploy your software per month? Twice. Twice per month. That's any environment. I don't mind if it's dev, test, whatever. Deployed to an environment. 
10. Anybody got a bigger number than 10? 100? That's awesome. Anybody else? Eighty-two thousand deployments per day at Microsoft. There's not eighty-two thousand software engineers at Microsoft. Some of these stats are pretty pretty huge. Two point four million Git commits per month. F almost five hundred thousand pull requests a month. Most of Microsoft is now in Git. And in moving towards this, towards being able to deploy this many times per day, um, it was a very interesting journey for them. So the things that they've learned, which are the things that I want to share with you, um, are uh, uh, this interesting list. And Microsoft talks about uh, three things. Uh, they call them the, the they call it the second decade of agile, or third decade of Scrum, if you're counting. And that's customer-focused, team autonomy, and something I think Microsoft coined shift left. We had this shift left term. We want to find out stuff as early as possible that doesn't work. So the first thing is being, being totally customer-obsessed. How did this team manage to get that engagement and involvement with their customers. Um, and I have an interesting story uh, uh, from my own experience. Other people, I've heard uh, their experiences as well with the new Microsoft. But it's all about listening to your customers. Now, while the Azure DevOps team are going to be, they have a developer community, uh, they're going to be looking at Stack Overflow, um, they're going to be taking feedback in the product, so you can just hit help and then make a suggestion. And I'm told um, they don't share any of the actual comments with us so that we can put them up, because apparently most of them have swearing in them. Because most people, especially developers, that are going to go click comment, it's not because they're happy. But if you do do that and make a comment, the developer that owns the feature, the developers that own the features on the page that you're looking at will be reading that comment. I had an interesting experience. I use uh, Office 365. I, my background is Microsoft Stack, so Office 365. And I had a, a problem with one of the features in Office 365. I couldn't put in a UK phone number. So I clicked the feedback button, had a nice sweary response uh, to, to the product team. I hit submit, and a couple of days later, I got an email from a, a product group manager, whatever that is. Um, who said, can we, can we get on a call so we can figure out what the problem is and how we can fix it? And I was like, OK. A couple of days later, got on a call. There's not just the product group manager, but there's the product owners for each of the products under that product group manager in this meeting of eight people that wanted to listen to me, not as an MVP, because they didn't know that, just as Joe customer who couldn't figure out how to solve something in their product. That's how important customer feedback is to modern Microsoft. You will be able to get on the call with the product team and figure out uh, how that is. And that was Office. That's not even Azure DevOps which started this. And in order to get feedback that quickly, having potentially releasable software is not good enough. When uh, the Scrum Guide was originally written when Scrum was envisaged 23, 4 years ago, something like that. It was hard to deliver software to production. It was super hard. It's not hard anymore. Anybody that tells you that it is has poorly written software. Yeah, it's not hard to deliver to production. So the Azure DevOps team now have a definition of done that is live in production. It's not done unless it's in production. That's important, because if it's not in production, you can't get feedback from your customers. Not only that, but you have to have telemetry in the features you ship that supports the hypothesis that you had that led you to build the feature in the first place. That's really important. Why are you building the feature? 
What's your outcome going to be? Jeff talked about it this morning. It's the same uh, uh, mental shift that Jeff is talking about. And to do that, they collect, oh, a lot of data. I'm, I'm told that just from Visual Studio, there's seven terabytes of telemetry come from the product. That's what features are used, how often buttons are clicked, so that they know how long people spend on different features, whether they're actually using different features, all of those things. So they have some awesome uh, data and a platform that lets you query that data. It's pretty good. But what are the metrics that are important to a large organization like this? They're definitely not interested in lines of code per day. So I have some, some interesting metrics. Usage, acquisition, engagement, satisfaction, churn, feature usage. These, these are things that they feel are important. What about velocity? Is velocity important? Velocity is important, but not the velocity you're thinking of when you're shaking your head. Time to build. Time to be able to get to the point where a developer can test their code. That's important. Time to deploy, time to learn. These are all important metrics. What about your production site? Because if you're going to be delivering continuously to production, I don't know what that was. Production metrics are important. So how long does it take you to detect problems? <laughs> how long does it take you to mitigate those problems? What's the impact on the customer? What do we not care about? I'm sure you're happy with some of these. Original estimate, completed. I love that those are on that list because every project manager wants them for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> Lines of code, team capacity, it's not important. The burn down of the teams themselves, ah, that's for them to go figure out what they're doing. Nobody outside of the team should really be that interested in the burn down, apart from as maybe a tool to help work with the team. <laughs> team velocity, number of bugs found. I don't care about bugs found, I care about bugs that are left in the product that we don't know about. That would be more important. Yeah? I'll be providing the slides afterwards, uh, so there's no, no need to take uh, pictures. The other thing that we need to do is do things more quickly. What you want to be able to do is find the thing that you feel for your team is the most painful thing in your process. Fix that. Or at least work on that. Find the most painful thing for you where you're going to get the most uh, bang for your buck. And one of those things for the Azure DevOps team was their life cycle. They had a two-year life cycle where they had a, a beta halfway through their two-year life, uh, the, the, a year's life cycle and a service pack in between. And they found that feedback, if they get feedback at that beta, so they release it to everybody, we try it and so, oh, well, this feature doesn't work the way we would like it to work. But they're already booked. They already have the rest of the time that they have on the product planned and they have no time to go change something that already exists. We know this is a problem. So they move to sprinting. They do scrum. They move to three week sprints because they're Product's very big and complicated. They have 42 teams working on one product, so they felt three-week sprints uh, would work well for them. But they actually made a mistake the first time they tried to do this. They decided that they were going to do five sprints, and then they would have a stabilization time to you know, mop up any things that didn't go so well. And what they found was that developers would know they had that safety net and would say, oh, we'll get that, we'll get that fixed in stabilization. So where they were expecting, this is the level of quality they were expecting, 
but this is the bug rate they got because they had that stabilization phase. Then, what's the one that uh, safe has a stabilization phase, doesn't it? Hardening sprint. That's the one. Or the let's build bad software and then fix it in a sprint. So when they moved the last uh, uh, their two-year cycle to continuous delivery of sprints, uh, they got a much better outcome from the teams. Much better outcome. Much higher quality levels, paying back technical debt. How much does technical debt cost you? Do you know, uh, use a lot? How much is a lot? How many features could you deliver if you didn't have the technical debt that you have in your product? Probably some. That's a very vague answer. It's because we don't know. This is the Azure DevOps team. In 2012, they were delivering 22 features to production per year. They paid back their technical debt. Now they're delivering that. 2017, when this stat was made, was not quite finished yet, which is why the number's a little bit smaller, but around 260 features to production per year. We're no longer spending 90% of our time struggling with complexity. Same number of people working on the product. That's really important. Being able to manage your code well, we, we while while we talk in Agile a lot, not about engineering practices, that was badly phrased, sorry about that. When we talk about Agile, we don't often focus on engineering practices. However, without good engineering practices, Agile will fail. That Agile idea within the organization, those Agile practices, the opposite is also true, okay? Uh, Microsoft have everybody on one branch with topic branches. Uh, they actually came up with their own uh, branching structure. You might be familiar with it. Oh, I have some animation. They call it release flow. There's a very good reason for them doing something different from just pure GitHub flow, which is what I use when I'm developing. And that's the, their releases, their, pro their product's huge. Absolutely ginormous. They have um, six and a half million users, thousands of databases to upgrade. It takes almost two, th uh, almost three weeks, almost a whole sprint to deploy their product. So at any point during their product lifecycle, you can have two versions in production at the same time. So you're going to have the current version in production is 100% in production at the start of the sprint. And then as we move through M1, the, the next sprint after M130, M129 slowly transitions towards M130. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, they have kind of. I know, it's, it's kind of You'd have to understand their crazy infrastructure. To, to, to understand how that works, but they have a number of scaled units and every database, every customer has their own database. So you need to upgrade each of the databases as you go along, so that just takes time. Data sovereignty causes pains. Uh, one of the ways they do this, or, or enable the ability to have that continuous release of features is feature flags, super important. Um, most of the time, they have, uh, they'll do, put a feature in the product, they'll do a, a public uh, blog post that says, email us if you would like to be part of this, and they turn it on for you. But that's not the important thing, it's about you turning it off. You will always have a little switch in the product to turn it off, and they care about the number of times it's turned off. And if it's more than 5% of the people that get it turned on, it's not ready for production. That's really important. 5% works for them. What works for you might be a different uh, number, but it allows them to have that, bring a feature flag in, have duplicate code. They do all of their UI stuff behind feature flags as well. And if any Azure DevOps users here, 
Oh, not that many. So if you click on your profile on the top right, you can actually just click preview features and there'll be a whole list of about 15 different features depending on what you've got access to. And you get things turned on there as well. So they swap out those uh, uh, flags and have them get rid of. So feature flags were one of the most powerful things um, that they had to build into their product in order to enable this. But they also learned something very interesting. What happens the day before a major event when you turn on the features for that event that you're going to announce? It doesn't work. So well, I've got a little graph. This is uh, uh, what Build, Scott Guthrie announced a bunch of features and took out the entire service for, seven. in fact, they took out the whole of Azure for seven hours because they turned on the features before the event. So the, the, the little dark secret that they have now is everything's turned on way before the event. You're not allowed to announce anything at an event unless it's been live for 48 hours. So you can go try the features even before the event if you can find them. So make sure you don't do that. Don't go live the day before the event. Uh, production first, uh, they focus almost exclusively on production. They have a huge live site culture. Um, I, I have a, a talk that I do just on live site because it's so important, uh, but they have live site engineering teams. Uh, they focus on transparency of those outages, not just within the organization, but with us as well as customers. So if you go look at the Azure DevOps blog, you will find every single one of the outages are fully transparent. They show you all of the logs, all of the data, all of the impact, all of the changes that they're going to make to the product in order to make sure it doesn't happen again, and how long that's likely to take. And that it could be years to solve some of those problems. They also found another interesting thing that I think um, there'll be people here who ha have an affinity with it. There's no such thing as partial automation. If you partially automate stuff, it's just not automated. And they found that they were using this uh, feature, it's called OneNote, and they stored a bunch of scripts that they would run, like one-off commands that you run once in this uh, uh, OneNote file. Can anybody see a mistake there? Anybody see a problem? The quotes, absolutely the quotes. They're the wrong type of quote for a command line. That's going to fail, and then you're going to have to go edit it before you run it. Now, what happens when you edit stuff before you run it? We make mistakes. So if you've got dozens or hundreds of steps like that, that's what happened to the Knight Capital Group. If anybody knows the story of the Knight Capital Group, they went, they went bust in a day. They lost $480 million in a day because somebody took out their software because they deployed to six of the seven servers, which is awesome. So don't miss a step. That's really important. Automate everything. There should be zero user interaction in your deployment process between developer commit and production. Even if you've got somebody going and clicking an approve button, zero interaction in the actual environments in the process. Uh, something Microsoft also did, that once they got their process uh, 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 awesome, the Azure DevOps team realized that you need to roll all of your security stuff every time you do a deployment. So every password, every encrypted key, every piece of security is refreshed every time you do a deployment. So then if somebody, you find that there's a hack, you can just do another deployment and refresh all the keys. <laughs> so automate everything, absolutely everything. This is uh, an internal dashboard that the Azure DevOps team has. Yes, it's still called VSO under the covers, um, but 
they have their full test matrix from deployment um, all the way through. That's their release stuff. You, if you just release to everybody at once, what's likely to happen? You uh, maybe impact everybody. So you need to control your exposure to production. However you do that. Um, I mentioned Azure DevOps has scaled units. Uh, they have a number of data centers around the world, and they deploy to data centers kind of based on size. You know, let's deploy to the smallest data center first, smallest number of users, and then scale out from there. My understanding is Windows is the last. They have their own scaled unit, because Windows is just ginormous. Um, and they, they deploy right at the end. But they effectively have uh, these rings. The first ring is their internal users. So we're going to break our folks inside first. Um, then the smallest external. Then the largest external international data centers. And then uh, the rest, which Windows is in the rest. Because they get very unhappy when their uh, environment goes down. So they have that live site culture where they, um, if, you're, if you're a developer, you, you own production in Azure DevOps. In most of the Microsoft teams now, you own production. So who gets woken up when production's down? Developers. Your team, your feature team, owns that feature from idea to production running it, maintaining it, and supporting it in production. It's the only way to make sure that we have full control over the things that matter to the users. It's the only way. So you need to have full control end to end. Uh, team autonomy versus, so it has plus enterprise alignment. That's kind of optimistic. It's a more of a versus thing, team alignment versus, uh, sorry, team autonomy versus alignment. In large organizations, you're going to have to have some level of alignment. You can't get away from that. You can't just have everybody doing whatever they feel like. Yeah, it's just not going to work. That's where the one ES comes from. You pick whatever language and technology you want, but we're storing the code in Azure DevOps. We're doing the builds in Azure DevOps, and we're doing the deployments through Azure DevOps. However you want to do those things and where you want to deploy to, that's up to you. Does that make sense? So that's just one example. That's my, uh, uh, so most of the stuff that Microsoft talk about around alignment are based on Dan Pink's work. Um, who's read Drive? Awesome. Everybody who hasn't read it, go read it. Either read the book. If you don't read books, get the audio book from Audible. If you don't do that, go watch the 15-minute YouTube video. Yeah, but at least, at least go through that. And it talks about how we as software engineers, and I still, I shipped software yesterday, so I still count myself a software engineer. Once we've got enough money that we're not struggling to pay our mortgage, put food on the table, and in my case, buy our board games, it's my hobby, we, we don't really care about money that much after that from a work perspective. It's nice to have, but it's not our driving purpose is getting more money. If we were in sales, getting more money is the whole purpose. What's the purpose for creative workers? And it's autonomy, mastery, and purpose. We want to feel like we're in charge of our own destiny. We want to feel like we're good at our job. And we want to feel like the stuff we do matters. It's really important. And in order to do that, you've got things in lots of different categories. You've got plans, practices, organization, roles, teams, cadence, and taxonomy. What needs to be aligned and what can be free? Let, you know, let the team decide. 
For Microsoft, plan and practices, 100% in the realm of the team. They decide on what they're doing. Roles, teams, cadence, and taxonomy, we need alignment. I, I, I've got a customer who had every single team, they had 90 teams working on one product, and every single team had their own sprint cadence. They had their own sprint numbers as well. So you could be dependent on another team who's currently on sprint 10, and you're on sprint 26, and you ask them, when are you going to have that delivered? And they say sprint 12, and you're like, when is that? I don't know when that is. Yeah, so you need some sort of alignment around taxonomy, the words that we use to describe things so that we're all on the same page, and the cadence so we can have that rational conversations. I, they actually, do you know how they solved that problem? They shipped a spreadsheet at the start of every sprint with a mapping for every team sprints against everybody else's sprints instead of just calling them the same thing. Anyway, so autonomy versus alignment. So they changed the team structure. Uh, they were originally program management, development, and testing. That was their structure back in 2010. Same as many organizations. I still work with organizations that have commercialization divisions, which is the testers. So they brought that together, program management, engineering, and ops, so there was no separate test. All testing is now automated, so you can't really have a separate test. They're just programmers, like everybody else. They're just programming tests, programming automations. Yeah? And then they moved um, out of that. That's their kind of hierarchical divisions. They also need to create a feature team. So a feature team includes management, engineering, and ops as part of that feature team. That's how they're able to support things in production. So they have people on the team who are specialists in live site, live site engineers who work on the team and make sure that they're not writing code that's going to be difficult to support in production. Yeah? How big would your teams need to be? Anybody? Anybody remember, what, what does the Scrum Guide say? Nine max. But it's a guide. That doesn't mean it's going to work for every organization. Nine could be too many for your company. For the Azure DevOps group, between 10 and 12 is their sweet spot. You've got to remember, Microsoft's got a lot of lawyers. I think they've got more lawyers than engineers, which means you have to have a lot of different skill sets on the team, so they have slightly bigger teams, but they do have physical team rooms. Microsoft just finished renovating all 120 buildings on the Redmond campus for the tune of, I think it was three or four billion dollars, into team rooms from offices. Every team room has space for 12 people to work together in a room that is not near any other team room. So you can't hear any other team room. They have weird corridor layouts in order to achieve that. And each of those rooms has a full video conferencing suite that can fit 12 people and two breakout rooms to use if you need to do something privately. And they're not bookable in the system. That's the team's room. Nobody else can use that. Those teams are self-managing. They can organize it however they like. All of those disciplines are in the room, um, and they generally remain intact uh, for between 12 and 18 months. They do have a way for the teams to reorganize. They do a sticky note exercise. Um, every 18 months, or between 12 and 18 months, and the teams choose their own teams they want to work on. There's some caveats in that, because they have a group in Redmond, a group in, um, what's the, Raleigh, which is in North Carolina, and a group in Hyderabad. So if you pick a team that's in a different country, 
we need to have a conversation, yeah? Um, but effectively, uh, the organization does that and they don't get a whole lot of people requesting to change team because they picked it, they own it. This is the team I picked. I think the last time they did this exercise, they did a stack ranking exercise, so kind of proportional representation type of thing. Uh, they do planning, like everybody else. Sprints, quarters, semesters, and strategy. Strategy is 12 months. And in the autonomy versus alignment, teams are responsible for everything below, well, halfway in semester. Everything. They build their own backlog items. The team's responsible for that, not leadership. Leadership owns the big picture. Where are we going? Where are our primary investments? This is our strategic direction. So that's uh, uh, pretty powerful. Um, Jeff talked about outputs, not outcomes. I know he kind of, I think he kind of didn't like OKRs. It's not going to work for everybody. It happens to work at the moment for the Azure DevOps team, and they do have a hierarchy of OKRs to give them alignment. Uh, so each of the services inside of Azure DevOps have OKRs, and that breaks down to each team having their own OKRs. Uh, but they do do hypothesis-driven uh, development as well. Uh, they keep aligned. You've got 42 teams in three locations around the world, three completely different time zones. You're not getting everybody in a room to do a retrospective for your whole product, a review and retrospective. Um, you're sending emails with little videos in them um, for how, how are we doing in our OKRs, are we in positive or negative for, for those things, um, and what have we just built for anybody that cares. Um, and then they collect feedback from all those users. That works for them, might not work for your teams. I think a lot of the transformational benefits are fairly awesome. Again, you'll get the slides. I got a five minute warning about three minutes ago, so I want to cover a couple of extra things uh, for you guys. Shift left. They used to have the majority of these, their tests uh, were end-to-end um, -end integration tests. I don't know how else to describe them than um, the whole product needs to exist and the test goes through the entire thing. Um, that was their L3. Uh, they use L0, 1, 2, and 3 because then they don't have to an argument about what is a unit test. They made up their own names and defined them. But for our, from our perspective, L0 is unit tests. So this is in 2010. That's their number of unit tests versus end-to-end -end integration tests. That they were in the same position as we, we all are. Yeah? Having those majority of our tests are these manual, um, manual tests. So they, they, they changed that. They started in Sprint 78. So three week sprints, they started in Sprint 78 and they paid back a little bit every sprint. And it took them till Sprint 120 to get that done. That's about two years, two and a half years, I think. Two and a half years to get rid of and rebuild all of their test infrastructure so that it was more efficient. And they actually went from um, running all the tests here was 48 hours. Running all the tests here is six and a half minutes. That's the difference they got out of that. How much less rework do you have because that is faster? Uh, so just in case you're wondering how many tests they have, so obviously pull requests, there we go, 78,000 tests are run during a pull request. That's a lot of tests. And the majority of them pass now, whereas if you have end-to-end -end integration tests, quite often things fail and you've no idea why. Now they don't get a lot of failures. Mostly they have green, which is good. So I think I, think I have negative three minutes. Is that correct? Yeah. I don't, I don't bother about time. Time is an abstract concept. So, 
They actually, they actually build two products out of the box because they still ship on premise, but they have a server, uh, uh, an online product as well, but it is the same product with the same code. They just have a bunch of if statements that let them switch between certain functionalities. And that's generally based on cost uh, because in the cloud, SQL Server is super expensive and blob storage is super cheap and on-premise SQL storage is super cheap and easy to back up. So they have a bunch of if statements to whether stuff's stored in blob storage or it's stored in uh, SQL Server, uh, which lets them have uh, that capability of deploying to different environments as well as uh, deploying on completely different platforms, which is good for them. But it's interesting. They're actually um, moving away from Windows. It's a weird statement for somebody to make about Microsoft. They found that this is, this is super inefficient. Super inefficient, having all these servers and environments and deploying. So they're, they're actually doing what the rest of us are doing. Going with Docker. And they're actually doing Linux Docker environments. So they're rebuilding, they're working through a process. It's going to take a very long time again, just like the, uh, uh, the tests of converting everything to um, uh, .NET Core. Runs on Linux, get it into Linux containers, and they found that there's a, like a massive performance increase in being able to do that. So that's uh, pretty awesome. Uh, I can talk. If you want to catch me afterwards over lunchtime, I can talk in depth about any of these things. So your journey is never ending. That's why I like the change from transformation to evolution. The company's just going to evolve over a longer period of time. But I think it's important to note that if you're using Windows 10, for example, which is a massive complicated product, you are getting continuous delivery to production every 30 days. You are getting a new version of Windows on your machine every 30 days. If you're a developer on the Windows team, the code you write today gets deployed to the CEO's laptop tomorrow. How does that make you think about code quality? It's going to make me think about it a lot. Yeah, that's important. We don't want to break the CEO. They actually have, when, you, when, you, when the alert goes off and something's broken, not Windows, but in uh, any product, and something's broken for customers, the voice message on your on-call phone that you get, like the automated message is Satya's voice. The CEO is calling you to tell you there's a problem with the product and get it fixed. I think that's quite, quite funny. Uh, so I'm just going to leave this here for a second, just, um, again, you can look at these things later. I know I'm negative 10 minutes now. Um, you begin a transformation, it's a roller coaster journey towards uh, making things better, and you do have to focus on engineering. But a thing you have to remember about DevOps, and I think this applies to Agile as well, <laughs> is it's not going to solve all your problems. People will solve your problems. DevOps is practices, Agile is practices, there's tools out there to help us, but ultimately, you're the ones that have to make the difference. Thank you. <laughs>